Um, so as we move into the more advanced students, you know, you want to have, you have to have enough tools that you can make decisions. So let's presume now you have somebody that you've worked with for a while and who comes to you who has a pretty good uh, operational sense of ways that they can practice to improve things. The thing is they get into the teen years is I find that they, um, and this may not be a fair thing to say, but sometimes their eyes are bigger than their stomachs. So, you know, they may think that they want to do this and that they can do this and they're ready to do this, but they still don't always really understand how much work it takes, you know, how, how much work it really takes to, to play that big piece, you know, that they want to play. So they think they're practicing, but it's not really getting that much better. Or they think they're practicing a lot, but really they're not, you know. Or they, 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 they know how to play their skills and arpeggios, but they're not really doing it every day, you know. And so, and what happens at this point is that the parents are done, you know. The parents at this point do not want to fight that battle anymore, you know. So when they're younger, the parent, you might, at, at least in some environments, you might have parents involved or you might not. But if you do have parents involved, at a certain point, they're going to stop coming to lessons and stop helping practice. And uh, that transition always, the kids sound worse before better. And I usually go more deeply into practice charts at that time, taping lessons, you know, more conversation, less music in the lessons until they can do more independently. And that's always a little bit of a slow part, but it pays off later. <laughs> um, but the parents are really, really done fighting about practicing. And, and you have to become the heavy at that point. You have to let the parents are, are driving them, they're paying, they're coming to concerts, they're supporting. They have 8,000 other things they're fighting about with their children at home. And, and you don't want practicing the violin to be one of them. So um, I usually ask the parents at this point, just let it go if there's fighting going on. If, if the child will still listen to the parents' reminders to practice every day, that's great. And there are families where, where the parents still can have remind and quote unquote make their kids practice. There are families where that is not going to happen. And, and if the parent is making the child practice, the kid is going to quit even though they love it. <laughs> so you don't want that to be the fighting thing. And um, as that happens, you have to take over more of being the heavy. So I find if, you, if any of you are teaching children from a young age to an older age, um, I find that around the age of 12 or 13, 11, 12, 13, 14, depending on the child, if I've had someone since they were young, I have to switch my relationship with them or they will need to go to another teacher who is a fresh face at that age. And some teachers don't like to teach past that age and they like to pass their students on and some people like to do the whole, the whole thing and that's very personal to, to each one of you. Um, and some teachers don't, you know, have no experience with young children and tend to only work with teens. But, <laughs> But if you do take them all the way through, I do a pretty clear discussion when I feel the time is right with the student um, that they're turning in to be a teenager and I'm going to ask the parents to bow out a little bit and that they're now more accountable to me. And um, whereas when I'm young, I'm like, I'm helpful when I'm doing this, you know, and let's do that again. Then I'm like, why isn't your Kreutzer prepared, <laughs> you know? Or, you know, I asked you to do that five times and I need to hear it next week. I'm not gonna hear your piece until I hear that. And, and if, because if, if you don't ever give a line, they won't do anything. They just won't. They just, it's human nature, it's not that they're bad. You know, it's just human nature. So if you kind of adjust to their level of not practice and preparation, that's where it's gonna go. Now, having said that, there are, there are some times when you have to make that adjustment. You know, you could say, gee, I'd like all my practice students to practice four hours a day. Well, you know, that's unreasonable. Not everybody's gonna do that. And you might, be, find a, a, you might find a fabulously workable relationship with a student who's practicing, you know, 30 minutes a day, loves the violin, tries to do what you ask, is improving, it's very peripheral in their life with all the other things they're doing, and it's fantastic. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for a balance with each individual child, with the amount they're working, and what you're expecting is making sense. They're respectful and they're preparing what you've asked to the best of their abilities, 
and, and, and you're working together. But they have to bring something to the lesson. They have to bring something. And I don't just mean that they have to bring you know, a piece prepared. They have to bring something of themselves to the lesson. <laughs> you know, some energy, some interest in learning, some, some something. Because teaching is a two-way street, I feel, especially as we get in with the older students. And I don't want to feel that, you know, parent is paying, kid is coming, I'm babysitting, you know, and child is not engaged. To me, that's not fair um, to me or, or to the child. And, um, and, and if they're not bringing anything, they don't seem interested, they don't seem to enjoy it, you know, I'm not talking about not being able to do something. That's a completely different issue. <laughs> I'm talking about not being engaged. Um, then I'm talking talk with the parents. Do, you know, to the child, do you love the violin? You know, do you love this? Do you like this? Do you enjoy this? I had a student once who I just tried everything. I tried being harder. I tried being easier. I tried fiddle tunes. I tried jumping on my head. I tried <laughs> everything. And he just would just kind of <laughs> play like this every week. And I finally um, asked him, I said, do you like playing the violin? And he's like 11 or 12. He broke into tears. He said, no, I want to play the trumpet. My dad wants me to play the violin. <laughs> and he just broke into tears. And, and so I talked to the parents. And, I, and, and uh, it turned out that the dad loved country music and wanted him to be able to play fiddle tunes. And I said, well, why don't you learn how to play the violin? You know, it's not too late. You can play the violin. You know, and, and let him play trumpet at his school. And oh, they didn't want to give it up, and it was the dad's dream, and we all know the story. But finally, um, I convinced them to let him start band, because it was right around that age, fifth grade or something. I said, let him start trumpet and band, we'll keep the violin lessons going, let's just see what happens. And by the end of that uh, year, he was like first chair in band. Of course, after all violin training, he has great ears, he can count. <laughs> and um, he, he, he's like getting all these kudos for his trumpet playing, and they were able to let the violin go. And so sometimes, you know, you have to figure out, does the kid really like it? And if they don't, I think you can help a parent say, it's okay. You know, maybe it's the wrong instrument. Maybe their aesthetic outlet is dance. Maybe it's art. Maybe it's song. May, you know, playing the violin when you're really little, you know, is okay. But when you hit a certain age, you know, you're going to try other things, and maybe it's going to be something else. And that's okay. And that's okay. But let's assume now you have teens that are liking it and are enjoying it and are going to stick with it. Um, I think I just ask them lots of questions. You know, I just ask lots of questions. You know, what, you know, do you like the way that phrase is? Do you like how it sounds? Show me how you're going to practice it. Tell me everything you know about shifting, you know? <laughs> um, so what happens is all the stuff you gave them when they were younger and you're doing all this work and telling them what to do and doing the physical work does not mean that they can explain that when they hit 13 or 14. It's a different part of the brain. They have it internalized, but they can't always explain it. So I usually go through a, a, another process of revisiting the technique in the high school years where I say, now it's time to understand what you're doing. <laughs> you know, and now we do Kreutzer. And do you remember when we did this? And show me a shifting exercise. Show me how you're going to practice that new piece. Do you remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know how to do that. Oh, yeah, I remember that. This is your bag of tricks how to practice. You know, use it. Be resourceful. Be creative. Make stuff up. You know, I'll do it in the lessons with you still on things that are really hard if you don't understand it. But you're going to learn this music way faster if you do this on your own time. And if you don't, if they don't do it on their own time, I still do it in the lesson because I want it to sound good, you know. And so, um, you know, at some point, it's like I had a student recently. He's a senior, and he's not going into music, and he's a beautiful violist. Play, he plays beautifully when he practices, and he was going through the, you know, get ready for college applications, and you know that that senior fall, and so he didn't practice much. I was just, you know, biding my time, biding my time. And finally, I said to him, OK, enough. I said, you have to, you have to do something. You, ha you have to do something. Um, because, and if you don't, I'm just going to practice with you. And, you know, like when you were 10. And he looked at me <laughs> like that. I said, because I want this to get better, and it's not getting better. So if you don't do it at home, I'll just practice with you. It's OK. 
I'll just practice with you. And he came back the next week. It was like that. <laughs> but I think you just never have to stop practicing with them, to be honest. That's what goes on in the lesson. You're practicing with them all the time. And um, they eventually will, will internalize it. In my um, pedagogy class that I teach at Peabody, we talk about these issues, of course. And most of them have very little practicing, I mean, teaching experience. But I ask them. At what age do you think you became a really good, efficient, holistic practicer? Thirty. <laughs> and most of them are like, I'll get there yet. Yeah. I mean, it's true. Most of them are like, I think I'm just starting to figure it out. Or, you know, 21, maybe. You know. And so I think when I when I work with them, it gives me more perspective of patience with my younger kids. Sometimes I feel like we're asking so much of these, so much of these kids. I mean, these kids are playing so beautifully, you know. I mean, really, in the scheme of things, they're playing so beautifully, and 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 we have to remember that, and and not to be too hard on 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 all the information we're giving them, and they're it's not all, you know, tied in yet. It's not all tied in yet, and I'm sure you all know have had the experience yourself of something that a teacher said to you once that didn't really click into your play until maybe five years later or ten years later. I've had that. I still have memories of things that I go back and say, oh, that's what he was talking about, you know, that I, you know, didn't integrate into what I understood. And so remember that it's again like parenting, we hope, you know, you're giving them all of this information and you're just really hoping that it will play out for them in a positive way down the line and you may or may not you're not going to see the fruition. They're going to go on to whatever's next. You know, you're, you're, we're just a piece in their journey. <laughs> and you have to be at peace, uh, at peace with that also, that their journey continues. And you hope that what you've given them, some kind of foundation, sensibility, physical, musical, attitude-wise, openness to learning, willingness to, to listen um, to anybody who has ideas for them, um, humility. Uh, humility, you know, feeling like, you know, you're in the same boat with all the other kids. If you go to an audition or a com competition, you're, you're all in the same boat as musicians. It's, it, they're, they're your peers, they're your friends. It's like field trip, you know. <laughs> you know, all, all, all that you try to give them to be in the music world, um, you know, you hope it will serve them well, and 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 uh, and, um, and I think it will. But in the end, the ones that really go on to go into music at a high level are self-directed. And whether I was their teacher, or you were their teacher, or you were their teacher, you know, they probably are going to end up like this, end up, you know, kind of regardless of which one of us was working with them. <laughs> and they're so, they become self-directed. And you all know, if you've had one or two students, or three, you know, None of us has a full studio of students like this. But you all know when you've had somebody who is so self-directed that regardless of the parents are just kind of following them along. The parents are not driving them. The parents are following them. They're supporting them. It's different. They're not, you know, saying, do this. They're just going, here's my kid. He wants to do this. What do I do? <laughs> you know, it's a very, very different thing. But they are self-directed. They want to play. They want to sound good. They want to figure it out. They are self-directed, and I think that's true in, in uh, any field. You can't make somebody be like that. So, you know, have compassion for those students of yours that, that um, are plugging along but maybe aren't quite that self-directed because probably they're going to be self-directed at something else. <laughs> and they're probably highly gifted at some, well, they are. I mean, everybody's highly gifted, I believe, at something. They're probably highly gifted in something else, and maybe they haven't figured out what that is yet. But their time in music and, and organizing how to practice and think and use all the different parts of their brain um, and experience in an analog, may I say it, fashion, you know, music with people and communication, oh, that's just going to help them no matter what they do. So I think we have to just, you know, really appreciate our part in what we're giving to them. So we want them to be independent thinkers and, and Lead them along that, lead them along that path um, to the best that you can, and they're going to keep developing. So I'm sure whatever you're doing with them is great.